The only comparable work that you could say matches up to it, or perhaps I should say flowering plants matches Curtis's bot mag, is Curtis's botanical magazine, started by a man called William Curtis in the 1790s in England. And it is still in publication, believe it or not, with much the same format and much the same in its outlook and object. And Paul Evans wanted to produce something that South Africa could be proud of. So here again, from the 1920s, we had artists who were on the staff of the Botanical Institute and were paid to do artwork. And there is one of the works of probably their most famous artist, Sif Naletti. Quite possibly some of you knew her, a wonderful lady. Um, Jill Condy, who's one of the artists who contributes, will tell me, Jill, what is our latest plate number? 1,002? 2,000. Sorry? 2,060. 2,060. So 2,060 have, plates have been published. And 87 artists. 87 artists. Thank you, Jill. You see, I've got wonderful support in the <laughs> audience. It is a great classic, and it's becoming a very rare and difficult to acquire work. This, I think, is Stella Gower, or is it Kathleen Ka Lansdell? But it will give you the impression, and that's Faye Anderson, of the same atomized, anatomized, fragmented parts of the plant to show the diagnostic features, which is so terribly important for identification. But I do think it's something we should celebrate. It is a wonderful work, it's worth supporting, and if any of you are interested, you really should buy the copies as they appear. One volume appears every two years now, and I really do hope and believe that it will continue at least till 2021 when it will have done a century. And there is no other New World country on this planet that has got anything to equal it. Well, times move on. And one of the contributing artists is this lady, Oriel Batten. And Oriel was beginning to feel that there were other important sources of data which should come into a picture. The habitat, the background. It was a time when ecological issues were paramount in people's minds. A plant didn't exist in vacuo, floating on a white piece of paper. It belonged somewhere. It lived in an environment. And that was then shown in some of the pictures. And this is what I mean by the evolution of botanical art. How the attitude has changed since the time of Theophrastus and Dioscorides. This is one of our local artists in the Western Cape, Linda de Vett, and she too shows a background. The Kuchelberg Nature Reserve, the corn, the fruits, the flowers, the seed capsule, all the pieces are there, but it's set into its background. And this idea caught on. And this is one of Barbara Pike's works. It's Allodiacotoma, the cocoboom. How different that is from the Claudius drawings. And it shows mature trees, a dying tree in the background, a seed capsule on the left, and a flowering shoot on the right. An enormous amount of ecological information. So plants were now being put into a setting which was relevant to the world they lived in. Linda de Vett, again, this is Hidnora africana, a very curious parasite which grows exclusively on Euphorbia mauritanica, which is the penciled in plant at the back. And she shows all the stages, penciled fruiting heads, the open flower heads in color, and the ripe fruit up at the right, splitting open and releasing the pulp. And there's another parasite drawn by her, Mistrapetalon tomai, which grows entirely and only exclusively on the roots of proteas. So the artists are not being given a plant simply in a laboratory and given to the artist and said, draw that. 
They're actually going out into the field, finding their own material, getting the feel of the atmosphere of the felt and the environment, and bringing that whole biological and ecological atmosphere to bear on the picture. It's, it's an enormous step forwards. Then there's Talia Lincoln, who sadly died a few weeks ago, a few months short of her 90th birthday. A most unique artist who did not draw or paint, who did not paint rather, but who drew with Karen Dash coloured pencils. And she always insisted on going into the felt, choosing her own specimens, and setting the plant in a habitat. This is Mimetes hottentoticus in the Protea family on Kuchelberg near Betty's Bay, growing with Chondropetalum tectorum with the mountains of Kuchelberg in the background and False Bay showing there. A huge labour, and she used this unusual technique to get this peculiar silver reflectiveness on the leaves, which no watercolour can ever achieve. Just show you another of her portraits, again with a background of distant mountains, Hermanus and the Stanford Mountains in the background. And finally you come to an artist like Jenny Hyde Johnson, who is from the Michalisberg. And here the whole concept of the picture has been expanded into a complete narrative. This is Ococanthera, which is sometimes called um, Bushman poison the flowering specimen, the shrub in its natural habitat, the young juvenile leaves, the maturing fruits, and the arrowhead, which would have received the poison at some stage in the past when the indigenous people used those plants. And here she has done exactly the same thing with that plant that I mentioned earlier, Buffoni distica. The whole phenology is shown the emerging flower head, which comes out before the leaves, the fully developed leaves in habitat, the old tumbleweed flower head, and the leaves being fed on by that diabolical pest, the amaryllis caterpillar. <laughs> highly, highly toxic, but very important in traditional African medicine as a bandage and for other medicinal purposes. And so, as a concluding image, I would ask you to look at that. Stone Age, pictoglyph, God knows how many thousand years that old that is, by some ancient person who walked the felt of South Africa and the way they depicted Buffoni Distica and the way a modern artist has depicted it in full ecological splendour. What I hope to have told you is that Botanical art is not static, it's, it's a changing dimension all the time. We don't know where it's going to go to. It's advancing, it's continuously evolving, and that's what's so fascinating about it. And what is very encouraging is there's been a huge amount of support all over the world for botanical art. And in 1964, the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh instituted a series of triennial botanical art exhibitions in one of their subdivisions called the Hunt Botanical Institute. And I believe they've shown the work of over 1,200 artists since then, and they continue. And more recently, a lady called Shirley Sherwood has formed one of the greatest collections of contemporary botanical art. It's on display at Kew in London, if ever you go there. She's a very wealthy lady. Her husband owns Overseas Containers Limited. So um, she has plenty of support in that direction. But she has literally given her collection to the British people, which is, I think, a, a marvellous gesture. And she has brought that exhibition to South Africa, and she's taken it round the world. It came to Kirsten Bosch in 1996, and it created something of a sensation because it depicts the very best produced by the very best artists from every country in the world. And it was so inspirational that it resulted in 
1999 in the formation of BASA, the Botanical Artists Association of South Africa. It's a strong, thriving organisation, and I suspect there are one or two members here today. And what I think you will begin to appreciate is botanical art is now no longer tethered to the needs of botanists. They are not dictating what has happened or what is to happen. The artists have been liberated from the constraints of size. They can draw, they can paint whatever size they like. Talia Lincoln's paintings are enormous. Barbara Jeppe's are enormous. So we have an independent, very assertive group of artists who I think are completely inspired by the marvels of the plant world. And I believe they will continue to produce images that are consistent with their creative instincts. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't gone over time.